Good morning, and uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for this opportunity. What I'm going to do is step back a little bit and really talk about what's basically a discovery pipeline for discovering additional therapeutic targets uh, to promote axon growth after spinal cord injury. It'll be a talk in three parts. I'll talk about the, the basic ideas behind the strategy. I'll highlight a recent success that we've had using this strategy. And then I want to take some time at the end to just lay out some, some kind of high-level ideas about how to, how to move this forward. So I'll, I'll start on a personal note. Uh, this is my mom. Um, she's uh, now also a grandma. Um, she's, uh, she's a C5. Um, she's been in the chair since 1987, so about 25 years now. Um, I bring this up, I guess, for, for really two reasons. Um, one is to just let you know that, that I get it, okay? I'm going to be talking a lot about cells. I'm going to be talking a lot about genes. Um, but in the end, it's not really about that. It's about people, right? The other thing is uh, I've, I've seen up close what it, what it takes to just put together a, a life after a spinal cord injury. She's still living in her own home. Um, the, uh, the discipline, the organization, the effort that it takes to do that. And so when I see the spinal cord injury community um, come together to put on an event like this, to come together in this way, um, it's really humbling. And uh, it's, it's just truly an honor to be here. All right, let's get to it. I think, especially after that last talk, it's pretty clear that, that a major goal is to promote the regeneration of injured axons and to restore the flow of information. I think everyone here knows that. I think most of us also know that there's two main barriers to doing that, OK? First, and I would say historically the best studied, is the fact that the spinal cord environment itself is hostile to axon growth. And there's no question that's true, and there's no question that that's important. Um, on the other hand, it's also become clear that a second main reason that regeneration fails is that neurons themselves, many neurons anyway, are intrinsically limited in their ability to mount an effective regenerative response to the injury. Okay? And it's the second half of the problem that I've been focused on um, really since I entered the field more than 10 years ago. Because it seems to me that um, these neuron intrinsic uh, limits to axon growth really place a fundamental constraint on repair, regardless of what you do down here in the spinal cord. In other words, the, the key question is how do we activate these neurons to let, them, to let them take advantage of growth opportunities down here? So how, how do you do that? Well, for me, the, the starting place is to remember that the inability to regenerate an axon, it's not the rule in nature. If anything, it's kind of a strange exception, right? Because look, if you look at invertebrates, if you look at flies and, and worms, most of their axons regenerate just fine after an injury. If you look at a so-called lower vertebrate, um, a zebrafish, most of their axons regenerate quite well after an injury. Some don't, um, but the bottom line is the fish will swim again after a spinal cord injury. Frogs, there's, there's an interesting case there. It turns out um, a tadpole can regenerate, but a frog can't, right? So they kind of span this evolutionary divide. Here's where it gets really interesting. If, if you look at a mammal, if you look at you or me or, or, a, or a rat, if you injure the spinal cord young enough in the animal's life, embryonic or just after birth in the case of a, of a rat, those axons can regenerate, OK? So even, even in, in the, the so-called central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord of, of a mammal, regeneration is possible. And then, of course, in the adult, our peripheral neurons, they can regenerate. So in other words, this inability of the neurons in our brain and our spinal cord to regrow their axons, it's, it's an exceptional trait. It arose late in evolution. It arises late in the development of an individual animal. And it arises only in part of the nervous system. So why, right? Why? Why can some neurons regenerate and others can't? And more importantly, what can we do about it? Well, the answers to those questions almost certainly have something to do with genes and the expression of genes. So I'm going to take just one slide to go over some really basic concepts of sort of the flow of genetic information in a cell. Um, it's, I, I know that it's a very knowledgeable audience. I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page before I get to the data and, uh, and some of the therapies. 
Okay, so if, if we start with, with a neuron, and, and let's just say that this is an embryonic neuron, okay? So after an injury here, it's able to regrow. And this is a mature neuron, so after an injury, it stops dead and it can't grow. Inside the nucleus of this cell, of course, there's DNA, and strung along that DNA are, are certain regions of DNA that, that are called genes, okay? Here's the important thing. These two cells that are behaving so differently, they have the exact same DNA in them and the exact same genes. In fact, all the cells in your body have the exact same DNA and the exact same genes. So how can all your cells do such different things? How come some cells make skin, some cells make bone, some cells make neurons? And more to the point, how come these two neurons with the same DNA, why do they behave so differently in response to an injury? Well, the answer is that although all the genes are there, they're not all active. Some of the genes are active and some of the genes are silent. And it's the combination of active genes that controls the behavior of the cell. Well, how does that work? What, is, what does it mean to be active or expressed? Well, what it means is that that gene, that little stretch of DNA, is used as a template to make an intermediate called RNA, basically kind of a modified copy of itself. And that, that process is called transcription, so the gene is transcribed. That RNA is then used as kind of a, a blueprint to build a protein, okay? And it's the proteins that make up the structure of the cell, that makes up the, the sort of the machinery of the cell, and it makes up all the command and control signaling events in the cell. So it's the set of proteins that's ultimately going to determine what the cell does, okay? Um, and like I said, um, different cells express different sets of genes, so they have different sets of proteins. Well, what controls that? Why, why is one gene active and one gene silent? Well, that brings me to a very important class of proteins, okay? There's a, a set of proteins, they're called transcription factors, and their job is to go to the DNA, to bind to the DNA at the sites of genes, and to either turn that gene on, in other words, make the RNA, or turn that gene off to silence it, okay? So that's, that's basically how it works. And this, this isn't just kind of biology 101. This, this really matters, okay? Because again, it's this basic process that's determining the difference in behavior. So if you want this cell here to behave more like that cell there, and we do, um, there's a few things that probably need to happen, okay? The first thing you'd wanna do is you'd wanna compare gene expression of expression, meaning the set of RNAs, between the two cells. And if you do that, you're going to find three categories of genes, right? The first would be a gene that's present or expressed in both of the cells, okay? And as such, it's unlikely to be involved in explaining the difference in behavior between them. So that, that set of genes isn't so interesting. What's more interesting would be a gene like this, a gene that's expressed only in the non-regenerating neuron but not the regenerating one. This would be a candidate to be a gene that's preventing axon growth, right? This would be a sort of P10-like gene. And the goal there, then, would be to knock it out, trying to restore growth ability. And then conversely, the third category of gene would be genes that are present in this regenerating neuron, but not the non-regenerating neuron. Um, excuse me, the RNA would be present. And those would be candidates to try to re-express in this adult neuron, or sorry, in this non-regenerating neuron. So if you could somehow put in the DNA for those genes, maybe you could um, restore the expression of that growth-promoting gene. And in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's really it. That's the whole idea I'm laying out. Step one, you compare gene expression. Step two, you try to figure out which of the genes are important for axon growth. Step three and four, you get rid of the growth inhibitory genes and you restore the growth-promoting genes. So the, the particular comparison that I've been focused on is this developmental switch, because I think it's really fascinating. Again, if you take these pups just after they're born, you cut their spinal cord, the axons will regrow and the animal will go on to behave completely normally, okay? Same injury, just a few weeks later, no regeneration, no recovery. So something fundamental is changing. And it turns out um, that many of those important changes are taking place in the neuron themselves. So the question is, what's different between the two ages? As I started my postdoc, uh, I was really lucky in the sense that another group actually did this experiment. They compared gene expression 
in cortical spinal tract neurons across this transition. They didn't do it because they're interested in regeneration. They had completely other questions, completely different questions, but they were good enough to share the data set and we were able to reanalyze it um, using this, this technique called microarray. The details aren't important. The point is you can just get a global picture of all the RNA that's different between two sets of cells. And what we found is that there's more than 1,000 genes that changed threefold between the two different ages. Some of those genes were more abundant in the older neuron. Some of those genes were more abundant in the younger neuron. And this, this is the problem with this gene profiling approach. It's not that you don't find genes that are different. It's the opposite. It's that you find so many genes that it's very hard to know which of those genes are the important ones. So it's a needle in a haystack problem, right? And, and it stumped the field for a long time, but there's, uh, starting maybe seven years ago, um, there's starting to be a, a solution to this problem. And I want to give credit where it's due. Um, these two guys at the Miami Project, uh, the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, they really had the vision to, to create the infrastructure to set this up. So everything I'm going to talk about was um, run by me, but the vision really came from these guys. So the basic idea is if you have 1,000 genes and you want to know which of those 1,000 genes are actually important to grow an axon, what you want to do is put those genes into neurons, actual neurons, one by one, until you find one that has the effect of changing the neuron's behavior. In other words, you don't try to, you don't try to pick the winners, you don't try to guess, you just ask the cell which is the most important gene. Well, how do you do that? You, you need a few steps, right? So step one is you need to have a way to, to be able to express these genes. And remember, a gene is just a sequence of DNA. And, and this is now a solved problem because you can just buy the DNA. You can buy what's called an expression library. And there's no mystery here. It's just a big stack of 96 well plates. Each well has um, a construct that expresses a different gene, right? So you can physically get um, the whole set of genes, or to be more accurate, you can get about two-thirds of the genes right now. Step two, okay, you've got the DNA. How do you get the DNA into the cell so that it can be expressed and it can make the protein? Um, this, is, this is a tricky problem, um, but it's also solved. It's not hard to do. It's hard to do it on a um, large enough scale to test a lot of genes. So the, the basic answer is you can take a, a, a neuron, you can pass current across it, it creates small holes in the membrane, and the DNA can actually go into the cell and be expressed. And what we did is, is adopt that, that basic technology and just kind of scale it up into a 96 well format. So now we can um, test 96 different kinds of DNA in a single experiment. So that's what we do. We, we take um, neurons from rodents, uh, we dissociate them, um, we combine them with the DNA, each well gets a different gene. Um, we zap them in this machine here. We put them into culture plates in a very stereotyped pattern. Um, and the final, and I think a really rate limiting step to this whole process is once you have a, a neuron that's expressing the DNA you're interested in, how do you get the readout? How do you know if the axon got longer or not? Um, what doesn't work is to try to sit down at the scope and, and manually count them. There's just too many cells and too many genes. You can't do it manually. So there's now an automated solution. It's basically a, a really fancy microscope. All it does is it um, automatically acquires images of every field and every well. And then it uses computer algorithms to trace the morphology of each individual cell in each individual well. And it reports back um, all this sort of morphological information about each cell. How many axons are there? How, how long did they grow? How often do they branch? Et cetera, et cetera. So what you get back are these enormous data files of tens of thousands of individual cells per experiment. But what you can do is basically weed, weed through the data and ask the bottom line question, which is, does forced overexpression of any of these developmentally regulated genes, does it have the effect of changing axon growth? And so it's a screen, right? Each, each uh, bar represents the activity of a different gene. The height of the bar represents the effect on axon growth um, in culture. And the point of this slide is that by doing this kind of screening, we are able to identify genes that had the property either of making axons longer or shorter, okay? 
So it's exciting. So we're, we're in new territory. We've got potentially interesting genes here. Um, and that's, that's basically where my postdoc ended. When I founded my own laboratory, where I wanted to take this was to the next step, which is, OK, we, we have genes. They're having this effect in a culture dish. How can we go about testing them in an actual animal? And this gets back to um, what Dr. Stewart um, introduced so well, which is the concept of gene therapy, the concept of packaging a gene into a virus and then testing its uh, function in an actual animal. And of course, there's, um, there's multiple goals here. One, you want to uh, increase the expression of the growth-promoting genes, and you'd also like to knock down the expression of the growth-inhibiting genes. And ultimately, you'd like to do both at the same time. So just gene therapy. And again, when, when someone says gene therapy, there's, there's nothing really mysterious or complicated about it. A gene is just a stretch of DNA, right? And a virus is just something that nature has created. I mean, a virus's job is to force your cells to express its DNA. So you can gut the viral DNA. You can put in your gene that you're interested in. You can take advantage of the, the virus's ability to, to infect your cells. And you can force cells in your body to express pretty much any DNA. If, if you can make the DNA, you can make your cell express it. This is a, this is a picture of a mouse brain. Um, and this is just to show that we can uh, very effectively express um, foreign DNA in, in mouse neurons. So this is just a, a green fluorescent protein to mark the neurons up in the brain here. And here's their axons um, on their way down to the spinal cord, which would be down here. What we did is basically set up um, an in vivo screening pipeline, um, a sort of low throughput screening pipeline. We've gone through about 20 genes so far. And the idea is quite simple. You just inject the virus into the brain to force the neurons to express these potential um, candidate genes or to, to knock down the expression of the potentially growth inhibiting genes. Then you challenge the cells with an injury to the spinal cord. And then you look in the spinal cord here. Here's, here's uh, it's called a sagittal section. You're kind of looking from the side. This is an injury site. This bundle of axons is labeled in green. And what we do is we look beyond the injury, looking for any kind of gene treatment that can um, induce the ability to grow past the site of the injury. And what I'm very excited to report is um, last spring we published a paper where we actually found such a gene. So the first thing to realize is uh, there was a huge fall off. Okay? Of those 20 some genes from the in vitro culture experiments that showed some promise, most of them did not have the property of promoting growth in vivo, OK? So there is, there is a, a really dramatic fall off in the system. But um, in the case of this gene, uh, we saw something really exciting. So again, this is the injury site. Here's the mass of axons coming down. In the control animal, there's almost no growth past the injury. These are all cortical spinal tract axons. In this particular gene treatment, um, we did see axon growth beyond the injury site. More recently, as I've gone uh, to my new position at Marquette, we've asked a few important follow-up questions. First of all, um, just like Dr. Stewart introduced um, with the P10 knockdown, we asked whether we can administer this gene after the time of injury. And the answer is yes. We still see axon growth in the spinal cord. And secondly, do we see any kind of behavioral improvement as a result of this treatment? And preliminarily, we're seeing some, some effect. So this is a test where the animal has to walk across a horizontal ladder. Um, in other words, it has to be able to um, coordinate its, its vision and its limb to be able to correctly place the limb. And what we see is that starting at about five weeks, we see a modest but significant um, improvement. Uh, that is a reduction in the number of missteps. This final week, we did something kind of interesting. Uh, we changed it up on the mice. We changed the spacing of the rungs. They'd gotten used to a very regular pattern. We made the, the spacing irregular. The control animals really struggled with this, um, but the, uh, the treated animals did much better, and they were able to adapt to the, uh, to the altered spacing. So it's, it's a hint that, that maybe there's some functional benefit to this particular gene treatment. All right, obviously, we're, we're excited about this. We're, we're thrilled. Um, we've, got, we've got a reagent that you can inject into the brain of an animal after the time of injury, 
that induces at least some axon growth and maybe preliminarily may have some kind of functional benefit. On the other hand, I don't, I don't want to oversell this and I don't want to make it more than it is because let's, let's be clear here, let's be honest. What we have right now today is a treatment that induces growth in a fraction of the total axons and they're growing a millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters in a mouse, okay? Right now, today, that's what we've got. So I think maybe the most productive conversation we can have is how do we build on that? How do we, how do we move forward? Because I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we know all the molecular players. I don't think we've fully unlocked the growth potential of these cells. So what do we do? One thing that we, we definitely need to do is just uh, start combining this treatment with all the other great options that are emerging. So one really obvious move, and I'm very excited about this, is to simply combine this uh, KLF7 treatment with the P10 knockdown that you just heard about. And one, one motivating factor to do this is we've actually looked in the animals that are, that are treated with, with our gene treatment, with this KLF7, and we've asked whether this mTOR pathway uh, that's so important for the P10 activity, we've asked whether that um, pathway is activated, and the answer is it's not, okay? And that's important. It means that our treatment is doing something in the cell that's different than the P10 treatment, which motivates the combination of the two. Maybe if you put them both together, um, they'll either be, have an additive effect or maybe a synergistic effect. So that, that's one obvious combinatorial treatment. The other is, um, we so far haven't addressed at all um, the environmental side of things, the injury site itself. One of the major um, inhibitory molecules at the injury site, you're going to hear more about this, um, are these so-called chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. And in the same way, kind of with the, as we did with the P10, we also tested, um, at least in culture, does KLF7 help these axons grow any better in the face of inhibition? And the answer is no, it doesn't. We're not we're not overcoming inhibition, we're just kind of ramping up the basic growth machinery. So might we get more growth if we did try some of these anti-CSPG treatments in the spinal cord? I'm hoping the answer is yes, and we're moving in that direction. I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll just make the point. Um, technologies moved forward, even from you know, the five years ago when I initiated that first screen. There's just much better ways to compare gene expression in cells. Um, I think that somebody, we, we, we can't do this now, but I think someone ought to take advantage of this new technology to try to turn up some, some new gene targets. Um, I'm not completely satisfied with the cells that we're using as a screening platform. I talked about that, that huge fall off between the culture result and the in vivo result. I think there might be better types of cells out there to test our genes in, and one very exciting possibility would be to use these human-derived induced pluripotent stem cells um, to, as, a, as a screening platform. Not something I'm doing myself. Um, I think there's people at the Miami Project trying this now, um, but I, I think an exciting thing to do. Finally, especially for me now, let, let me be clear, at Marquette, I don't have this fancy screening equipment anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for other ways to try to turn up new molecular targets, because we need more molecular targets. We're, we're not there. I, KLF7 isn't going to do it by itself. I can't speak for P10, maybe it will. But I, I don't think we're there yet. So how do we find more genes? I'm going to lay out two basic ideas of, of how to do that, and I'll, and I'll end with that. One is really just taking what I'm going to call a bioinformatics approach. Remember I talked at the beginning about all the different kinds of neurons in nature that can regenerate? Well, there are more and more um, data sets available to describe the expression of genes in those regenerating neurons. And this is now my hobby. I, I basically collect data sets and I keep them on my computer and I have a big Excel file. And, and I look for genes that are common between these different categories of regenerating neurons. And when I did that, just as one example, there's another transcription factor, so it's an interesting kind of gene, um, called SOX11 that really jumps out as sort of always being there in these regenerating neurons. And based on that, I, I basically went for it. I made a virus that expressed SOX11. And preliminarily, what it looks like is um, in the same way that this KLF7 was, was promoting regeneration, SOX11 appears to be doing the same thing. 
So we're very excited about that. I think we've turned up um, a second gene target. And again, we didn't screen, we just kind of, just kind of used, used our brains on that one. One final idea that, that I'm excited about. Um, again, Dr. Stewart uh, introduced this, this idea of the potential convergence between basically cancer research and axon regeneration. Um, the idea being that genes involved in cellular growth, some possibly aberrant cellular growth, in the context of a neuron might actually promote the growth of an axon, right? Um, this, this idea's been out there for a while. I wanted to try to find a way to, um, you know, how do you use that to, to move forward? So here's, here's what I did. First of all, I'm focusing just on these transcription factors because they're so well positioned to control the behavior of a cell. I wrote a review recently, and, and other people have too. There's about 12 transcription factors where there's good evidence that they have a role in axon growth. On the cancer side, um, I did uh, basically some data mining. There's, there's some nice websites out there. And I was able to assemble a list of about 210 transcription factors that are important for cancer growth, okay? And then I just asked the simple question, well, what's, what's the overlap between the two? If there really is some convergence between these processes, you'd expect there to be sort of statistically higher representation of, of genes in one list on the other. And what I saw, just, it, it blew me away. Of the 12 transcription factors that have already been shown to be important for axon growth, 11 of those 12 showed up on this cancer gene list. 11 of the 12, okay? That makes me really excited to look at the other 199 genes on this list, right? Because I think it's a very good bet that somewhere in that list, we're going to find more genes that are important for axon growth. And I'll, I'll kind of land on this. When, when I think about this, man, 200 genes, I wonder if we shouldn't just cut out the middleman of the in vitro screening entirely and just make pools of virus and just do an in vivo screen. Just go into an animal with a spinal cord injury, inject, say, a pool of 10 viruses at a time, and just look for genes that have activity in vivo, okay? I think, uh, I think an experiment along those lines has the potential to, to really move the field forward and uh, hopefully come up with some new molecular targets. Everything I've talked about is either um, non-therapeutic, meaning sort of pre-treatment with genes, or a gene treatment right at the time of injury. What are the prospects for chronic injury? I think it's an important question. Um, the short answer is we don't know yet because we haven't done the experiments. Um, I have a request for funding in to, to try to do experiments with the KLF7 virus in, in chronic injury. Um, who knows? I mean, we know that in chronic injury states, neurons enter this kind of dormant, atrophied state. Maybe by restoring these, these growth-promoting transcription factors, maybe it's possible that we could reverse that straight. We'd reverse that state. We don't know yet, but it's certainly something I'd like to find out as soon as possible. So what did I tell you today? Um, look, most neurons can regenerate. Our brain and our spinal cord are an unfortunate exception to that rule. Um, and it probably comes down to, to whatever genes are differentially expressed. So you can compare gene expression, and you can screen their function in in vitro. You can move the genes in vivo with viruses. And so far, this, this basic strategy has shown um, one and maybe two sort of um, uh, preliminary, uh, I don't know, preliminary reasons for hope, I guess I would say. And what I really want to emphasize is the need to, to keep pushing this basic strategy forward to, to try to turn up new molecular targets. With that, I'll conclude. I want to especially thank um, these two people. Zimei is my, my postdoc surgeon. She did all the animal work I talked about. And uh, this is a new guy in my lab. He's heading up all the behavioral work. And then uh, a set of students. So thank you so much for your attention.